Now comes the moment that we have all been waiting for. The program files, the logic, the relay ladder logic. We are going to cross the line that separates the data files from the program files. For this family of processors, the program files, the files that store the sequential logical instructions are labeled ladder X beginning with ladder 2 up through ladder 255. This family of processors allows the user to organize their logic into as many as 254 program files, ladder 2 through ladder 255. Ladder 2 is unique in that it, it always executes automatically whenever the processor is the run or remote run modes. Ladder 3 through ladder 255, however, require a special instruction to jump from ladder 2 to their location in memory and to execute them because they are actually subroutines and they are subject to the execution of ladder 2. With data files and program files, the file numbers are arbitrary. For data files, you can create new files number 9 up through number 255 and you can have any data file number between without successive data files. You can have a data file 47 without having a data file 9 through 46. For program files, you can create ladder 3 through ladder 255. You can create a program file ladder 15, LAD 15, without program files 3 through 14. They are markers only, like flags on a golf course. They can be sequential in number, but in truth, they only identify the subroutine and can be executed in any order. Ladder 2, LAD2, LAD2, is the only routine that always executes. Although memory is memory, a different set of rules apply to the working with files below the line than those above the line. Data files have one set of rules for editing while program files have another set of rules. Even though the technology to do online editing is the same anywhere in memory, the processors in this family of processors, the ones that do allow online editing, do not allow the expansion or contraction of the data arrays in the data table, which means everything from the dash line down cannot be altered in size while you were online in the run mode. But the program files, the ladder logic itself, in some of the processors in this family, you can edit and change those online. The smaller processors in this family of products, with the exception of the newest one, do not allow online editing. The larger modular processors do allow online editing but none of these processors allow you to shift the size or shape of the data table files much less create a new data table file while online with a processor. You can expand, contract, and create new data table files offline only. You can edit the logic online but not create a new program file online. With the newest family of processors not covered in this presentation, you can do almost anything online and in the run mode. While we are on the subject of being online with a processor, let's briefly introduce the project or program documentation, what we refer to as the man-readable stuff. The stuff that we see on our computer screen, the text, without which we feel lost. By now you have realized that the variable b3 colon 0, a 16-bit integer, was designated before any I.O. data structures were added to the memory layout, which would have moved the actual location of b3 colon 0 to a higher location of memory, and yet this thing that most of us refer to as an address remains the same. And of course this is because it is not an address, but a variable and when it gets moved around the process is invisible to us. The variable name doesn't change but the memory location that it points to changes. 
the most accurate explanation of this relationship between the variable and the memory location is this. When you download, the memory layout is translated into real memory locations. The actual program that downloads to the processor is in machine language, a language that most of us do not understand. The language that we created this program with, the program files and the data table files, is graphics based and what downloads to the processor is entirely obscure to us. Let's pick a single bit B3 colon 0 slash 0 from the variable B3 colon 0 and look closely at the nomenclature. First of all, we cannot see the real memory location or the real memory ID. It's numerical, it's probably in hex code. We use a variable pointer, operand, or tag name. Also referred to as an alias. This is an alias for the real memory address. Since we never see the real memory address, we'll stick to variable tag name pointer operand because later on we will create an alias for the variable or the tag name. Many find the default variables to be inconveniently named. They represent positions in a numerical array and that alone allows us to know where the bit is located in memory structure by its variable name. However, when the bit is used in your logic, and comes to represent whether or not the machine is in the manual mode, B3 colon 0 slash 0 means nothing to anyone trying to analyze the logic. For this reason, the manufacturer of the programming software allows us to assign an alias to the variable that is more indicative of the use of the bit. For this programming software, they have chosen to call the alias a symbol. The symbol is unique to one variable and the software will not allow you to assign the same symbol name to other variables once it has been used. So, you could say, the symbol and the variable name are interchangeable. When you are creating logic, you can type in the symbol and it will bring the base variable with it. With this programming software, the symbol is limited to a single line of 20 characters. If more descriptive nomenclature is needed, this programming software allows you to add a description and associate it with a variable. Although I show only three lines, the descriptions are limited to five lines of 20 characters, almost enough to write a book. The programming software will not inhibit you from assigning the same description to two separate variables, so beware. It's not like the symbol where it will prevent you from using the same symbol twice. It will allow you to put anything you want in those 5 by 20 characters for the description. Now this is a very important point that I want you to remember and, and not forget this. And that is this. The symbols and the descriptions reside on the hard drive and in your laptop's RAM, but the symbols and descriptions are never downloaded to the processor. This means that if you write the program on your laptop, download the program into a processor on a machine, ship the machine off to Timbuktu, and then someone in Timbuktu connects their laptop to this processor and goes online or uploads with another laptop, there are no symbols and no descriptions for them to see you have to send the offline file along with the processor for them to open first in their PC or their laptop before they connect and go online. Another point, there are no online projects, only offline projects. You can go online from within an offline project, download and upload from within an offline project. If you do not have an offline project for the program in a PLC, when you connect to it, you will find this out. You will then have to create a new offline project, then from within the newly created offline project, upload and go online.
The PLC is just one component of an industrial control circuit. How does it fit in with some of the other components, such as an MMI or operator interface, the screens, as people refer to them? Well, folks, you're looking at the whole shebang here. I have added a few external influences to enhance our story. You, Larry Laptop, Pete Panel View, Repeat Panel View, and Repeat's other brother, Repeat Panel View. While there are some inexpensive processors, such as the one used in the training manual, that do not have two communication ports, most have two communication ports as shown here. We have U Larry Laptop connected to channel 0, and we have several MAN machine interfaces networked to channel 1. Channel 0 is typically RS-232 and uses the DF1 DH45 protocol whereas channel 1 can be an addressable DH45, an addressable Data Highway Plus, or even better yet, Ethernet. The CPU, Central Processing Unit, is central to everything that happens, the kingpin. We ought to mention that the firmware has an active role in this process and that there is another chunk of code called the executive that is really the primary execute, which in turn executes the code that we have downloaded. Our code that we have created does not have instructions to go retrieve the input image information, etc. That is the realm of the executive code, which we cannot access. What exactly does this executive code, which is built into the processor, do for us? When we first put the processor into the run or remote run mode, the first thing the executive does after a little house cleaning is to activate the input modules on the back plane one at a time in sequential order and store the images or input status of each of these modules into the memory locations designated for each slot in the input data table file one. How long this takes is dependent solely upon the quantity of words that have to be activated one at a time onto the backplane and transferred into memory locations. Remember, some of the processors in this family allow 30 possible slots of I.O., that's slot 1 through slot 30, and each slot is capable of transacting 32 words in and 32 words out. That is 920 words one at a time over the backplane into the PLC's data file number 1 and then another 920 words transferred out of the PLC's data file 0 to the individual slots that have output cards one word at a time. Once the processor has a fresh snapshot of the input states, it begins accessing the logic one rung at a time. The processor grabs a rung of logic, which is comprised of instructions, each of which have a memory location that they address and reads the value from each of these memory locations into the processor. Crunches the logic and with its logical relationship to the values in each of the locations that each instruction addressed, then spits out the results to the memory locations that were addressed by the output type instructions. This is followed by activating the output modules one at a time sequentially over the back plane and transferring the data from the controller's memory to each module associated with that word of memory to control the output devices. This is the primary cycle that people identify with the PLC. Collect inputs, execute the logic, storing the results, and then sending out the results to the output modules. But before the CP retrieves the next input image, the communications functions are seen too. We have Larry Laptop, Pete Panel View, and his two brothers to communicate with. Unknown to most, these entities out there connected to the COM ports have equal access to all of the memory locations that the program has access to. Any memory location that has an instruction can address the laptop, can alter from the keyboard the MMIs 
read from or write to them as well. Let me say that one more time. Any memory location that has a variable, the laptop can access that variable from the keyboard. The MMIs can access that variable as well as the program can access that variable. So at any given instant, I would say within a one second period, somebody at the laptop, somebody at an MMI, and the program itself could be changing the state of bits in that memory. In this industry, we refer to this type of system as having naked data. That means that while you are intently troubleshooting this machine, a board operator can be walking by, poking buttons at random, and changing the data in the data table. Even changing the screen on an MMI can change a variable in the PLC. And of course, Lori Laptop, which should be you, can change any of the variables directly from the keyboard. The, the characteristic of this type of controller that really identifies it as having naked data is that you can plug another PLC into one of these COM ports and by means of a message instruction read anything from this memory and write anywhere into this memory without this controller needing to give the other controller permission. One of the simplest and yet most often misunderstood terminologies in this business is the concept of syncing and sourcing. First, syncing and sourcing only applies to DC circuits and is of no concern with AC inputs and outputs. Every DC circuit has a minimum of these four basic elements. The positive source of voltage, the negative common or sync side of the voltage, a load, which is the object of the DC power supply and a means to control the load such as a switch. Now we've assembled these four elements into a circuit. We have the high side of the supply or the positive side. We have a load. We have a switch to control energize, de-energize of the load and then we have the sink or low side of the power supply. Pure and simple, of the two devices, the load and the switch, the closest device to the source or positive side of the power supply is sourcing and the device closest to the sink or negative side of the supply is sinking. If you swap the control switch and the load positions in this circuit, the switch is now sourcing and the load is sinking. It's that simple. Whichever of the two, the controller or the load, whichever the two is closest to the source is the source, whichever is closest to ground or the sink is the sink. Sourcing, sinking. You're probably looking at this comparison here and wondering what the big deal is and why it even matters. Remember that the control device in this illustration is a dry switch contact, not a solid state device such as a transistor. So in this case, that switch, same switch, can be used in either position as a sourcing input device or a sinking input device. Now let's look at an actual input circuit. You should recognize this from a previous illustration of previous presentation. Now if you don't recognize this, go back to the earlier sections on the active backplane, review them, and then come back here and watch this section again. First thing to point out is that the sensor has an open collector NPN interface to the input circuit of the input module. So you could say the output of the sensor is open collector. Therefore, it has to be syncing. It has to be on the low side of the circuit. The input circuit of this module is the load and the sensor is the switch. V sub CC or the positive side of the supply 
and ground the negative side of the supplier sink between the input circuit of the input module and the sensor which would you say is sourcing which is closer to the source not a trick question just an easy question that is correct the input circuit of the module now which then is closest to the sink now that's too easy because there's only one left right yes the sensor so in this circuit we have a sourcing input module that requires a sinking sensor or an NPN sensor in this circuit the sensor and the input circuit have been have been swapped around in their relationship with the source and the sink again which of the two is closest to the source you got it pretty simple huh and of course what is left to be the sinking device yep the input circuit of the input module it is important to point out here that I have used a universal input module that will accept either sinking NPN sensors or sourcing PNP sensors however here's the fly in the ointment of this whole sourcing sinking discussion every circuit has a sink and a source so when you are identifying the input module do you identify it by where its circuit fits in the DC circuit or by what type of a sensor that you apply to it is it a sinking module because its its input circuit sinks the sensor or do you call it a sourcing module because it requires a sourcing sensor to be sure with different manufacturers you need to look at the wiring diagrams in the manual that come with the modules to make sure before you actually connect sensors well that's all folks but wait there's more now, what is this thing on December 16, 1947, Bretain and Bardeen, under the direction of Dr. Shockley, built this point contact transistor. This is actually a photo of the original point contact transistor. Made from strips of gold foil on a plastic triangle. You can see the plastic triangle right there in the middle. Pushed down into contact with a slab of germanium. Later, Dr. Lee, Dr. Shockley himself designed and built the first bipolar transistor that remained the mainstay of the industry for three decades. Now, Bell Labs decided to announce the invention on June 30, 1948. There was some time lapse between the point contact transistor and the actual announcement. Bell Labs settled on the name transistor, combining the concepts of trans resistance with the names of other devices like thermistors. The invention went unnoticed at the time, both in the popular press and in industry. However, Shockley saw his potential. He quit Bell Labs and founded Shockley Semiconductor in Palo Alto, California. He hired the best engineers and physicists, but Shockley's personality drove away eight of his best and brightest. Those eight engineers founded a company called Fairchild Semiconductor. Two of the eight went on to form Intel Corporation. They and others at Texas Instruments together invented the integrated circuit. Shockley's company was the beginning of Silicon Valley. In the 1950s and 60s, most U.S. companies chose to focus their attentions on the military market in producing transistor products which left the door wide open for our friends the Japanese like Akio Morita and Masari Ibuka who founded a company named Sony Electronics that mass produced transistor radios. This was the form that transistors took for the first couple of years and it pretty much stayed in this form for a decade or two. This is called a top hat transistor and if you look inside you'll see the lid has been cut off to expose two of the three terminals coming up from the base and you'll see two fine wires uh, going over to a little 
square with a little white spot in the middle of it. That is the actual transistor right there. The actual transistor device is much, much smaller than the case that it was mounted in. A closer look reveals the actual device was a half a millimeter square with two leads delicately soldered to the emitter and the base of the device. Let's take a more in-depth look at exactly what a transistor is. This next sidetrack discussion here is information outside the scope of this training package, but it is of great interest to enough of you to include it in the miscellaneous sections of this presentation. First, some background The Bohr model of the atom in front of you will be sufficient for the basis of our exploration of this subject. An atom, a single atom, is so small that no one has actually seen an image of one. Atoms are so small that millions of them would fit on the head of a straight pin. This simplified illustration has all the basic components of an atom. The nucleus, made up of neutrons and protons, and a cloud of electrons orbiting around the nucleus. It is key to note that there are an equal quantity of each. This atom has three neutrons, three protons, and three electrons. The neutrons are considered to be of neutral charge, and theoretically a neutron is made up of one electron and one proton. But we'll just say it's a neutral uh, charge and part of the mass whereas protons are positive and the electrons are negative in charge. And as you know, equals and opposites attract. The electron is negative, the proton is positive. They are attracted to each other, but because of the energy levels of atoms under normal temperature, the electrons are energized by that energy and are trying to fly away from the nucleus but the proton, being positive, holds the electron in its orbit around the nucleus. The equal quantities of electrons as negative charges and protons as positive charges give the atom a net balance electrical charge with no electrical field emanating from the atom. This is a graphical representation of a single silicon atom showing a full count of protons and electrons. Notice that this atom has three levels of orbits, each represented by an, an ellipse from a small ellipse to a mid-size ellipse to a large ellipse. Notice that this atom with its three levels of orbits, the innermost has two electrons the intermediate orbit has eight electrons and the outer orbit, which is called the valence ring, as it is referred to, has four electrons. Silicone is said to have a valence of four. The outer orbit has four electrons, that's the valence orbit, therefore it has a valence of four. The valence electrons, those in the outer orbit, are all we are concerned with when discussing semiconductors. So let's simplify our atom to show just the valence electrons. Okay, so this represents a silicon atom with four electrons in the valence ring. We put a Roman numeral four on the periodic chart. It would fall under the column of four. Silicone is actually an excellent insulator. So we will need to modify this substance to make it a semiconductor. And we will do this by working with boron, which is a trivalent. It has three electrons in the outer orbit. I show a fourth little spot there as a dashed line just in reference to the fact that it only has three. And then, of course, also arsenic which has five electrons in the outer orbit. So here we have a trivalent, a quatrivalent, and a pentavalent material. Silicon is our base material, but we're going to work with the impurities of boron with three electrons in the outer orbit and arsenic with five electrons in the outer orbit. Okay, pure silicon 
represented here as a crystalline structure, a lattice, each atom having four valence electrons. For reasons well outside the scope of this discussion, a valence of eight electrons is the optimum situation for silicon or for an insulator. In other words, each atom would like to have eight electrons in its outer orbit. In this structure, you can see a lattice of silicon atoms, each with four electrons in their outermost orbit. And although there are only four in each of the atoms' outermost orbit, those four electrons find themselves in the company of electrons from the surrounding silicon atoms' valence electrons. They form up into pairs, and now each atom behaves as if it had eight electrons in its outermost orbit. This behavior is called covalent bonding. This is silicon. What about the other two players in this story, boron and arsenic? Let's allow an impurity of boron, one atom of boron, into our lattice of silicon. We still have covalent bonding, but notice the bonding of an atom of boron into a structure of silicone. The three electrons of the boron atom bond to the three electrons of surrounding silicone atoms, but one of the surrounding silicone atoms is left without an electron to bond with. This electron is firmly held in place to the silicone atom by the protons in the atom, but this leaves a hole so to speak, in the lattice perfection. In other words, in the lattice structure, if you look at the whole structure as a complete entity, this one spot where this one boron atom has made it up, it's three valence with three surrounding silicone atoms, it leaves a hole for one of the silicone atoms. However, the electron that didn't bind up, it's firmly attached to that silicone atom to the proton of that atom but it leaves a hole in the structure that would kind of like to have an electron to fill it up. Because the hole wants an electron, we say that it has a positive charge and therefore this silicone substance, doped as they say with boron, is said to be p-type silicone. Uh, typically, one atom of doping substance per 100 million silicon atoms. So we're not talking about a high density of boron added as an impurity to silicone. One in 100 million. Now let's consider arsenic. Here is one arsenic atom as an impurity. Notice that every atom has total covalent bonding. But now we have a lonesome electron with no, no one to hang out with, no electrons to bond with. This electron is not an extra electron because it is there to balance the net electrical charge of the arsenic atom. But in the big picture, it is looking for a place in the structure. Electrons are negative, so it is no surprise that we refer to silicone doped with arsenic to be N-type silicone. Now, typically it's one atom of doping substance per 100 million silicone atoms. However, when they actually manufacture semiconductor material, transistors, there is, they use different doping densities between the emitter base and collector to get what they call transistor action. We'll look at that a little bit later. Okay, how do we make a transistor? Well, let's start out with a substrate of N-type silicone and build a thick layer of P-type silicone through high vacuum deposition. Now, basically what that means is they put it in a vacuum change chamber, pull all of the atmosphere out, drop it right down to a micron of vacuum. In other words, no gas molecules floating around. Then into the chamber, they inject vaporized silicone and vaporized boron, and this material settles 
and builds as a structure on top of the silicon dope with arsenic. So it gives you a layer of uh, boron dope silicone on top of the layer of silicon dope with arsenic. Okay. After they do that, then they also, by photographic etching, apply a mask that leaves areas exposed where they want to do more work on the p-type material. The next step is to use a corrosive chemical to etch a well into the p-type material and notice that it only etches where the masking material was not. So the black represents the masking material. The next step is another high vacuum deposition and they deposit n-type silicone and the mask prevents it from going anywhere but inside the well. Once the well is built up then they remask to protect all of the p-type material and a large portion of the n-type. Back into the process a corrosive chemical etches away another well into the n-type material. Back into the process again through high vacuum deposition they deposit a layer of p-type material into the well that they just etched. And the last step is to then connect uh, electrical contacts to the p-type material in the middle and that's the emitter and then another contact to the n-type material between the two p-types that's the base and then the collector. And you'll you probably will notice here you, you probably wouldn't take note but take note that the collector surrounds the emitter. Now the base surrounds the emitter but later on when we talk about transistor action when the emitter emits current carriers into the base because the collector surrounds that whole area it's easy for the collector to collect those current carriers that were emitted by the emitter. So, PNP and NPN transistors. Now you see why they call it p-type material and n-type material because the current carriers are either holes or lonely electrons. Now I'm paraphrasing a little bit here but hang with me. So the difference between a PNP and an NPN is simply the construction. N material supplies electrons, P material supplies holes. Both configurations, PNP or NPN, have three connections, the emitter, the base, and the collector. The actual circuit symbol for a transistor will have an arrow representing the emitter. The direction of the arrow always points to the n-type material. So you see on the right you have a symbol for a transistor and the emitter has an arrow pointing to the base. The base is n-type material. Now this is not the reason that they have the arrow pointing to the base. They have the arrow pointing to the base because the arrow is pointing in the direction of conventional current flow or hole flow. I'm not going to stop and explain the difference between conventional current flow and electron flow any more than saying that originally they thought that current flowed from positive meaning an excess to negative meaning a deficiency and so it kind of stuck so whole flow is what's represented by the arrow conventional current flow not electron flow so the arrows pointing in a f to represent a flow going from positive to negative okay the NPN also has a symbol and notice the arrow points towards the emitter because the emitter is n-type material and that is the direction of conventional current flow. The reason I like to point out that the arrow points to the n-type material that's how you remember what these symbols are. So when you see that top symbol the arrow points to the base the base is n-type so it's PNP. The bottom symbol the arrow points to the emitter therefore it's NPN. Okay, 
That's real interesting, but how does a transistor actually function? Let's examine a single junction of p-type and n-type silicone brought together. First we'll start with the n-type and then we'll uh, form a junction with a p-type material to an n-type material. When we do that, it's going to form a depletion region or a depletion zone. Basically what happens is current carriers diffuse from the p-type material into the n-type and the n-type into the p-type. So there's an exchange of current carriers between the two different types of doped silicone. So when the, when the two materials are brought together, a depletion region forms spontaneously across the p-n junction. Electrons and holes diffuse into regions immediately adjacent to the junction until they are uniformly distributed. N-type material or N-type semiconductor has an excess of free electrons compared to the P-type region. The P-type has an excess of holes compared to the N-type region. Therefore, when the N-doped and P-doped sections of semiconductor are placed together to form a junction, electrons diffuse into the P-side and holes diffuse into the N-side. Upon the departure of an electron from the N side to the P side, a positive donor ion is left behind on the N side. Remember, if an electron leaves a electrically balanced atom that leaves behind a proton, which is a positive charge, that has no electron to balance it. Therefore, that atom will appear as a positive charge. They call it a donor ion. In this case, it's positive, and it's left behind on the N side. And likewise, when the hole departs from the N side, it leaves a negative acceptor on the P side. So when a hole departs for the N side, it leaves a negative donor ion on the P side. Following diffusion of the majority current carriers across the junction, the electrons come into contact with holes on the P side and are filled by recombination. So in other words, these electrons went over and eventually fell into the holes that we showed you earlier. That's called recombination. Likewise, for the injected holes when they arrive on the N side, the net re result is that the injected electrons in the holes are of none effect but leave behind charged ions adjacent to the interface in a region with no majority current carriers called the depletion region. It's called depletion because all the majority current carriers have been depleted in that region. But there is also a charge across that region caused by the donor ions that were left behind. This creates an electric field that provides a force opposing any additional diffusion of charge carriers. In other words, what drew them across was satisfied by what came across and what came across creates an electric field, a charge that opposes any further transfer or exchange. So it builds up to an equilibrium. This electrical field that extends between the charged ions is referred to as the building voltage, junction voltage, or barrier voltage. So let me summarize. Current carries from the P-type drift over into the N-type, drawn by the N-type. N-type carriers drift over into the P-type. They recombine, meaning the electrons fall into holes. Therefore, in the holes that went the other direction, uh, cancel out the electrons. So there are no current carriers now in that entire depletion region. But there's a charge left by the donor ions that were left behind. Okay, uh, let's freeze this in an instant in time right here, and let's say we just connected this single cell DC battery up to a PN junction. If a direct current voltage is applied across the junction, positive to the N-type material and negative to the P-type material,
electrons will flow from the negative side of the battery into the p-type material and it will the positive side of the battery will pull electrons out of the negative side notice what that does those electrons that are injected into the pink side the positive side they will travel over to the junction and further increase the size of the depletion zone whereas the electrons drawn off the gray or n-type material pull more electrons out of the area adjacent to the joint on the inside, the gray side, further increasing the depletion zone. So you see our little blank gray and pink areas increased in width caused by the battery. Now what's going to happen here, remember that as you increase the depletion region size, you're increasing the number of positive and negative donor ions on each side. That builds up a charge or voltage across the junction, the barrier voltage. When it equals the battery voltage, everything stops. This is called reverse biasing a PN junction. So remember this later on when you hear reverse bias, forward bias, that's what they're talking about. Now let's do just the opposite. Let's flip the voltage around so we have the negative side of the battery applied to the n-type material and the positive side of the battery applied to the p-type material. Electrons flow from the negative side of the battery are injected into the n-type material and electrons are pulled away from the positive side of the p-type material. This causes more free electrons to go across the junction into the p-type material and eventually you have a steady state flow of electron majority current carriers through the junction. Now you could also say that you have positive carriers flowing in the opposite direction. I tend to always work with electron flow. Uh, you could also show this with hole flow because the positive side does inject holes into the p-type material. But in order to get this to work you have to have equal transfer of the current carriers from the N and the p-type material. This is called forward bias. Okay, this is kind of a catch-all diagram of a bipolar junction transistor. They refer to it as a BJT, bipolar junction transistor. And a, a bipolar junction transistor is a type of transistor. A BJT, bipolar junction transistor, is a three-terminal device constructed of doped semiconductor material and it can be used for amplifying or switching applications. Bipolar transistors are named so because their operation involves both electrons and holes as opposed to a unipolar transistor such as a FET or field effect transistor in which only one carrier type is involved in the charge flow. It's a whole different construction than what you're looking at right here. This diagram is one that I got off the internet. It's public domain and a real in-depth discussion of this is really way outside the scope of this presentation. However, uh, because there is a lot of interest in PNP, NPN, well what does that mean and how do they work, I'm going to go ahead and do a little discussion with this diagram. If at the end you don't uh, completely under understand everything we talked about, don't worry about it. It's not germane to programming a PLC or troubleshooting a PLC anyway. Okay. Although a small part of the transistor current is due to the flow of majority current carriers, which we discussed, most of the transistor current is due to the flow of minority carriers. So bipolar junction transistors are classified as a minority carrier device. Now what's a minor minority carrier? Well, n-type material has free electrons and those are the majority current carrier. Any hole flow in an n-type material is considered minority current carriers. So 
Electrons are majority in the n-type and minority in the p-type. So holes then are majority in the n-type, minority in the p-type. In typical operation, the emitter base junction, notice you have an E, a B, and a C symbols there. So on your left is the emitter, on your right is the collector. Notice that in an NPN, electrons flow from emitter to collector. And then in the middle you have the base. So when they say emitter base junction, they're talking about the junction between the green and the blue on the left. The collector base or base collector junction is the junction between the green and the blue on the right. The power supply between the emitter and base, which is the V sub B E to the left, down below the transistor, that is the forward bias voltage to forward bias the emitter base junction. The higher voltage, V sub CB, voltage collector base, is the reverse bias voltage for the collector base junction right above it. Both of those batteries together in series, V sub BE and V sub CB, supply the current flow that goes in the emitter and out the collector and back. Now, In typical operation, the emitter base junction is forward biased, and the base collector junction is reverse biased. In an NPN transistor, for example, such as this one, when a positive charge is applied to the base emitter junction, the equilibrium between the thermally generated carriers and the repelling electrical field of the depletion region, remember we call that a barrier voltage, becomes unbalanced, allowing the thermally excited electrons to inject into the base region. These electrons wander or diffuse through the base from the region of high concentration near the emitter towards a region of low concentration near the collector. The electrons in the base are called minority carriers because the base is doped p-type, which would make holes the majority carrier in the base. The base region of the transistor is made very thin so that the current carriers that diffuse across it in much less time than the semiconductor's minority carrier lifetime. Now, what that's basically saying is you make the base, the green material, really thin compared to the blue material. That way, when the electrons get injected in from the emitter, they drift over towards the collector and have a chance to get to the collector before they recombine in the base. Now, once the, the, the electrons, the free electrons, that drifted over to the base because of the forward bias of the base emitter, emitter base junction, if they get close enough to the collector, the positive charge in the collector will reach out and grab them and pull them in the collector. So you could say that the uh, electrons that were injected into the base from the emitter are collected by the collector and go back to the battery. That represents the majority of the current flow going through. But this depends upon the proper ratio of density of doping between the base material, the emitter material, the base material, and the collector. Now this, this is a lot to take in in what I'm going to give you here, but we're taking a shot at this. Get what you can out of it. As I said, the base region of the transistor is made very thin so that the current carriers can diffuse across it in much less time than the semiconductor's minority carrier lifetime. To minimize the percentage of car carriers that, get, that re get recombined before reaching the base collector junction. In other words, we don't want to give the minority carriers time to find a home before they drift close enough to the collector to get collected or the, the majority current carriers. To ensure this, the thickness of the base is much less than what's called the diffusion length of the electrons. Don't worry about what that is. But you get the idea. The base is purposely doped a little less dense and it's made thinner to provide this transistor action. The collector base junction is reverse bias, so little electron injection occurs from the collector to the base. But electrons that diffuse through the base towards the collector are swept into the collector by the electric field in the depletion region of the collector base junction. So, 
the collector emitter current, which is the main current flow, can be viewed as being controlled by the base emitter current or by the base emitter voltage, by the bias voltage. The portion of electrons able to cross the base and reach the collector is a measure of the bipolar junction transistor efficiency. The heavy doping of the emitter region and the light doping of the base region cause many more electrons to be injected from the emitter into the base than holes to be injected from the base into the emitter. So basically, because of the difference in doping and the difference in size, when the transfer takes place, a lot more electrons go into the base than holes go into the emitter. Well, these electrons have nothing to recombine with. They drift over, come under the influence of the collector base junction, and are collected into the collector. The heavy doping of the emitter region and the light doping of the base region cause many more electrons to be injected from the emitter into the base than holes to be injected from the base into the emitter. The common emitter current gain is represented by the symbol beta. It is approximately the ratio of DC collector current to DC emitter current gain. Let me repeat that. It is approximately the ratio of the DC collector current to DC base current in forward active region. So if you take uh, the current going through the base into the emitter versus the current going all the way through emitter to collector, that would be the gain. So if you were looking at amplification, the ratio of the collector current to the base current would be the beta, basically. And typically that's around 100 which means that as you control the current flow into the base, the emitter collector current flow will vary in proportion to that base current. If the collector current is typically 100 times higher than the base current, that gives you a current gain of 100. Now I'm paraphrasing and cheating a little bit in the explanation. I just want to give you a kind of a fuzzy view of transistor action. So this current ratio, it is approximately the ratio of the DC collector current to the DC base current in forward active region, and is typically greater than 100. Another important parameter is the common base current gain, or alpha. The common base current gain is approximately the gain of current from emitter collector in the forward active region. This ratio usually has a value close to unity or 1. And typically it's going to be a little less than 1, so it's around 0 0.98 to 0.998. So basically you're saying that it's the ratio of the collector current over the emitter current. Now since some of it recombined is lost in the base, the collector current will never be as high as the emitter current because some of it goes through the base. So it's always going to be just a hair less than unity or one. Alpha and beta are more closely or more precisely related by the following identities of an NPN transistor. OK, uh, don't worry about the following identities. Um, that's a little more than I wanted to do in this discussion. So, a bipolar junction transistor consi consists of three differently doped semiconductor regions. The emitter region, the base region, and the collector region. These regions are, respectively, P-type, N-type, P-type in a PNP, or N-type, P-type, N-type in a NPN, as seen here in this diagram. Each semiconductor region is connected to a terminal appropriately labeled emitter base collector. The base is physically located between the emitter and collector and is made of lightly doped high resistivity material. The emitter is heavily doped while the collector is lightly doped. Now we don't want the collector highly doped because we don't want it emitting into the base. 
So the collector is lightly doped, allowing a large reverse bias voltage to be applied before the collector base junction breaks down. So if we highly dope to the collector and then put a notice that B sub CB is larger than B sub BE. The collector base power supply has two cells where B sub BE only has one. That's just to imply that it's a larger voltage. If we had heavily doped the collector and put a high reverse bias voltage on the collector base, then it would break down and conduct. We don't want that. It would avalanche and conduct. The collector base junction then is reverse biased in normal operation. The reason the emitter is heavily doped is to increase the emitter, emitter injection efficiency. The ratio of carriers injected by the emitter to those injected by the base. That's the gain. For high current gain, most of the carriers injected into the emitter base junction must come from the emitter. Small changes in the voltage applied across the base emitter terminals, the E and B terminals, causes the current that flows between the emitter and the collector to change significantly. Significantly, This effect can be used to amplify the input voltage or current. Bipolar junction transistors can be thought of as voltage controlled current sources, but are more simply characterized as current controlled current sources or current amplifiers due to the low impedance of the base. This is a silicone transistor, but early transistors were made of germanium. But most modern bipolar junction transistors are made from silicone. A significant minority are also, no, also made from gallium arsenide, especially for very high speed applications. NPN is one of the two types of bipolar transistors in which the letters N and P refer to the majority charge carriers inside the different regions of the transistor. Most bipolar transistors used today are NPN because electron mobility is higher than hole mobility in the semiconductors allowing greater currents and faster operation. Therefore NPN is a superior bipolar junction transistor to the PNP BJT. The arrow in the NPN transistor symbol is on the emitter leg and points in the direction of conventional current flow when the device is in forward active mode. PNP transistors consist of a layer of n dope semiconductor between two layers of p dope material. A small current leaving the base in common emitter mode is amplified in the collector output. In other terms, a PNP transistor is on when its base is pulled low relative to the emitter. The arrow in the PNP transistor symbol is on the emitter leg and points in the direction of conventional current flow when the device is in the forward active mode. Okay, I, I know that was a whole lot real quick and I fumbled with my words in a few spots, but I hope you get the general idea of transistor action in a kind of a quick little summary here. We have an emitter, a base, and a collector. The emitter emits current carriers into the base. Because the base is more lightly doped than the emitter, they can't all join up and recombine. So some of them got to go someplace, someplace, and they drift over because the thinness of the base. They quickly get over to the base collector junction to the depletion zone and are pulled over into the collector and collected. So the collector current is always slightly less than the emitter current by whatever current is actually flowing in the base. So all of the current goes through the emitter and then some of it goes to the collector, some of it goes to the base. The ratio of the current in the collector to the current in the base you could call the gain or the amplification. So you vary a real tiny current this emitter base current that causes a larger current a hundred times or more larger going from the emitter collector to vary in step with the current that's varying emitter base. That's how you amplify. You put in a small current signal you get out a large current signal that is varying 
in step with the base current, therefore amplification. Okay, NPN or PMP? Uh, that's always a discussion. Japan uses almost exclusively NPN. Here in the States, people tend to like PNP. Uh, the input circuit on the top is a PNP. You see a PNP symbol. And on the bottom, that's an NPN. Now, for the PNP, if back in the old days when you went out and measured a sensor with a meter, the sensor to ground, if the sensor was conducting, you would measure voltage. You would get voltage. If the sensor wasn't conducting, you would get zero volts. Okay. If the sensor's not conducting, then the 24 volts is felt across the open circuit, which is the sensor. It's not on. Whereas down below, the NPN, if the sensor is conducting, you're going to measure zero volts, and if it's not conducting, you're going to measure 24. And back in those days, uh, the people that performed the majority of the maintenance on this equipment, if the sensor's on, they like to see a voltage, and if it's off, they don't want to see a voltage. So you can see here that PNP sensors, when the sensor's conducting, you're going to measure 24 volts DC from the sensor output to ground because the sensor is very low impedance, so the 24 volts is felt at the input of the module to ground. Whereas the second example with the NPN sensor, when the sensor is conducting, the sensor has a very low impedance, and the 24 volts is felt across the input circuit, which is not what you're measuring. You're me measuring from the sensor output to ground. You're going to measure 0 volts DC, or close to it when the sensor is conducting. And when the sensor is not conducting, you're going to measure 24 volts DC. So let's say you add both NPN and PNP out there. Well, when you go out and troubleshoot with a meter, you're going to have to know whether it's PNP or NPN, sourcing or sinking, to determine which is on and which is off. For PNP, on is 24 volts. For NPN, off is 24 volts. Or you could say for PNP on is 24 volts measured from the sensor to ground. For the NPN measured from the sensor to ground on is 0 volts DC. Take your pick. Well, that's all folks. Really, that's all she wrote. <laughs>